we are going to be looking at the theme of pursuit in the Father's house. We are going to be looking at the theme of pursuit in this story. And I want to start here by getting you to imagine that there were two workplaces that shared the same building, but these two workplaces were very different kinds of spaces. So you walk into workplace number one, maybe this is on floor, let's say floor three of the building. You press the lift, you go up to floor three, and what you find in workplace number one is suited employees, sat at desks, back straight, eyes locked on the screens in front of them, complete silence. Maybe that's what is waiting some of you tomorrow morning. Workplace number one. Eyes straight on the screen, back straight, silence as they sit at desks. You take it in, you breathe the air of workplace number one, you go back to the lift and maybe you press floor 10. Let's go for floor 10. And you walk into floor 10, and what you find are people in surfing shorts, looking casual, uh, flip-flops, lying on sofas, dipping their hands into a packet of crisps as they kind of look, workshop ideas, man. Like, let's just dream a little and let's just think and, and, and take some time over this. You think, okay, maybe that's waiting some of you tomorrow in uh, Monday morning workplace. Now, what I've painted a picture there of is the, the power of posture. The power of posture, what we do with our bodies communicates what our internal attitudes are. What we do with our bodies and our posture communicates what we value. Culture is encapsulated in posture. I'm not saying either one of those two workplaces is right or wrong. Uh, you've probably got your preference. Um, but. That illustration serves to show us that you can instantly catch the culture of a place by what people are doing with their bodies in that place. And I want to suggest to you that here in the parable of the father's house, the parable of the prodigal son, we can learn a lot from the postures in the story. What are the characters doing and what does that show us about the culture that is being carried in their lives? What does it show us about what they value and what does it show us about where we find ourselves in the story? Who are we most similar to and who should we want to become like? And I want to particularly home in on this theme of posture in the story because I think it relates to two of the most important questions we can ask ourselves this morning. What is the posture of God towards you? And what is the posture of our church towards each other and the world around us? What is God's posture towards you this morning? And what is our posture towards each other and towards the world? If you were to walk into God's house, press the lift number and enter in, what would you find God doing as you arrive? And if someone was to literally press the lift, uh, as we got here in Channel View, and walk into Grace Church spaces, whether a home, a Grace community, or here on a Sunday, what does the way that we are and relating with each other say about what we value and who we are, what culture we are carrying? This is so important because, on the one hand, we, what we think of God's posture will define our relationship with him. Have you ever tried to be a really close friend to someone who's really standoffish? Anyone? Like, we give up, don't we? Once someone ceases to open their lives to us, like, eventually we're just like, it's a lost battle. I can't have intimacy with that person. The posture of that person towards us defines our relationship with them. So what happens if we've got a faulty view of God's posture towards us? Our relationship with him suffers. And likewise, on the other hand, with that second question, we, the church, are called to be, whether we like it or not, friends, we are God's representatives to this world. 
we bear the name of Jesus Christ. And so how we are with each other and with others actually defines how someone will access what God is like in our lives. Can you see how this is a fundamental, these are fundamental questions? What is God's posture towards you? What, what is our posture towards each other and towards the world? We find the answers in this wonderful story. So first of all, let's just consider the three postures in and around the Father's house in the story, Luke chapter 15, 11 to 32. The first posture we find is the posture of the younger son. And the younger son, the story starts with the son leaning away from the father's house. And he goes full scale, drink of the pleasures of this world, but eventually he discovers that if you live your life in selfishness, chasing after your pleasure, what will you end up with? You'll end up enslaved. When we chase our own pleasures and our own selfish desires, that is a recipe to become a slave to those things. And so finally, he comes to his senses, having spent himself on wild and lavish living, and he returns to the father's house. And what is the posture that he returns to the father's house in? He's hanging his head low in shame. And he's wondering, will the father take me back? And he's preparing his speech. Maybe I could just be a servant in your house. He's coming to the father's house in a posture of shame, head bowed, neck bent, feeling the weight of the world and of his poor decisions upon his shoulders. And I want to acknowledge right from the start that that is a posture that maybe many of us are carrying. We come to church and we don't come full of the joy and the zest of knowing Jesus, but we come all too mindful of the ways in which we failed him. All too mindful of the ways in which our lives have been characterised by mistakes and missteps. We come with a posture marked by shame, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I want to say, if you feel ashamed by your sin, you are one step away from the Father's party. That's amazing, isn't it? His posture changed in an instant when he turned and he faced the Father. The Father embraced him and brought him in. A posture of shame can be changed in an instant. You don't have to earn your way back up the ladder, start as a servant, and then you might become a, a kind of chief servant, and then you might become the friend of the Father, and then eventually, if you really work hard, you can become a son of God, a child of God again. No, God is in the business of Reposturing those who live in shame, of, of, of healing in an instant those who live carrying the shameful posture in an instant. He wants to do away with that. If you're carrying a posture of shame, if you're living your relationship with God based upon a feeling of, I am not good enough for God, then it's not a matter of, okay, let's work through that. Let's unpick that. Let's try and help you bit by bit. No, God comes and says, I want that gone today. <laughs> The cross has done enough, and every attempt of us to try and climb the ladder back to God is an offence to what God has done to us, and he instead wants us to just run into his arms and live in a different posture of celebration. So that's the posture of the younger son, posture of shame. And then you've got the posture of the older son. And whereas the younger son starts leaning away from the father, the older son is leaning inward on himself. He's out in the fields. He can hear the celebration as the son has returned home. But he is distant from the father. And he is maintaining, he's in like self-maintenance and self-preservation mode. He's, he's seeking just to get on with his work and his life and living by his own uh, values apart from 
the father. He gets angry when he hears a celebration. It says he refused to go in. He even has to call a servant to find out what's going on. So distant and absent is he from the father. Here is a picture of someone who is self-interested, who is living for their own comfort, working hard so that I can enjoy myself. Someone who is entitled and on a maintenance mode. And sadly, if we're honest with ourselves, and if I'm honest with myself, churches can be places of the posture of the older brother. We live with self-interest. We live in maintenance mode. We live in a sense of entitlement. We are, we're in. We're the in crowd. We've got the Father's ear, and we've never left. Or if we did, it was a long time ago, and now we're busy working the fields. We're not careful, a posture can creep in of self-interest and self-preservation that may be actually nothing like the Father's heart. And the older son is not only repelling the Father because he's so self-interested and keeping the Father at arm's length, but he is repelling the younger son. He's not there to welcome with open arms his brother who's gone and squandered everything but returned home. He's not there to join in the party and the celebration. He is just interested in what's going on in his little field. And the celebration of the father's house, what is it to the older brother? It's an inconvenience. <laughs> Welcoming the lost home? Inconvenient. I've got a field to work. Having a party, rejoicing in the Father's love, inconvenient. I've got some cattle to look after. Can't you see how hard my work is? Can't you see how much I've got on? I've got no time to enter into the Father's joy. Tim Keller writes of the older brother, if our churches aren't appealing to younger brothers, they must be more full of older brothers than we like to think. We're not making room for those who are lost and broken to come and find home with us. Then to some extent, we have to look at ourselves and think, am I just living in self-interest and comfort and maintenance mode? Am I more concerned with what's going on in my little world than what the Father is up to, joining in his plan, his purpose and his posture? Which leads us then finally to the posture of the father and the father is neither pursuing pleasure in a selfish wandering way nor is he maintaining comfort and control of his little world but rather if the younger son is leaning away towards pleasure and the older son is leaning inward towards his own convenience the father is leaning outward towards the lost he leans towards both of his distant boys. On the one hand, he goes down the road to meet the son who's coming home. On the other hand, he goes out to the son who's working the fields. And the suggestion in the story is that the father has been waiting every day for his precious lost son to appear on the horizon. He's a father who is leaning towards the lost in desireful relationship. So desiring is the father of relationship with us that he allows the son to leave. Take my wealth, take my possessions, want me as good as dead. Go into the distant country and squander all you have on selfish living. Because he wants relationship to, with, with us. When he sees that prodigal return home, what does he do? He pursues with all his might. He willingly dirties himself in order to sweep this son up who would have been stinking of pig food. And he takes that mess and that anguish of a life spent in selfishness and the father absorbs it into himself. You know, as they were going into the party, they both would have been stinking. They both would have been dirty by the, the younger son's decisions. And that shows the radical pursuit of the father, that he is willing to get dirty and messy and stinky in order to bring us home. 
what he did on the cross. Jesus fully identified with us. He hung there naked as he died on the cross to identify with humanity in the depths of our shame, of our exposure, of our rebellion against God. Jesus became a mockery on the cross welcome us back. You know, we were thinking a few months ago about the armour of God, and memorably, it's the only message where I've ever done this, I took off a belt from my trousers, I think, in the middle of the message and re reapplied it. Well, did I come without a belt? Anyway, that's a complete aside. Um, but do you remember what I said about the belt in the ancient world? The belt was designed to keep everything, like, in place, so that you had full mobility, so that Roman soldiers were able to move with agility and with speed. Well, the suggestion here is that this father, who would have been a man of dignity and a man of honour, who would have been a man clearly of great wealth, with cattle in the fields and robes and rings for fingers, in that moment as he rushes down the road to meet his son, is filled with compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. He breaks all protocol and willingly dirties himself to welcome home this rebel. That is what the Father is like. That is the posture of the Father. And not only that, he then leaves the comfort of the celebration to go to the older son and to entreat him and to plead with him to come and to enter into enjoyment of the lost coming home. He is a father who leans towards the broken and towards the entitled. Sometimes when we read the story of the Gospels, we marvel at the way that Jesus is sharing with tax collectors and sinners and drawing them into his circle of love to show the love of God the Father for sinners. And then we hear what he says to the Pharisees. We think, uh-oh, Jesus really doesn't want Pharisees in his team. Why is Jesus speaking with such passion? and clarity and challenge to the Pharisees who would have been like the older brother, entitled, self-preservating, preserving, maintenance mode, all about my comfort and my religion. Jesus was challenging them because he was reaching out to them. He wanted to restore relationship with them too. He was going out to the fields, a posture of leaning towards the religious who had lost their way draw everyone into relationship back with the Father as the Father does him. This is so important we see this. What is the posture of God towards you? Is the posture of God towards you the older brother? Or maybe if you've experienced Christians giving you the cold shoulder or treating you with a self-righteousness, coldness, maybe if you've experienced churches that don't seem interested with you as a person, but interested in you for what they can get out of you. But once again, I, as someone who in some measure represents church, I want to say sorry if that is what you have experienced churches being. And if that has become projected onto your view of God, a God who's busy working the fields, but when I come home, nowhere to be found. He's got his stuff. He's running the universe. He doesn't care about the little old me and my mess and the missteps that I've made in my life. Not only the parable of the prodigal son, but the whole witness of scripture is that that is not the posture of God towards you. Right back in the Garden of Eden, human beings screw up. They take the fruit, God said, you shouldn't take that. They hide in shame because they realize what they've done wrong. And what does God do? Well, before he casts them out of his presence so they can see what they have done against him, the first response of God is, where are you? Where are you? And that is the Father's heart for every one of us who has wandered and squandered. God calls out to us. He comes looking for us. He comes to find us. Not only that, throughout scripture, you see, if you want to um, take a week or two weeks, or it'll probably take you a year to do this, 
Go through every verse in the Bible and try and discover what is God's posture towards the people that he loves. You'll find verses like this in Psalm 116, verse 2. He leans to listen to the prayers of his people. Imagine that. It's not a God who, when you're praying, has got his headphones on, and he's enjoying his own little experience of life. No, he is giving you his ear, leaning into your whispers and to your fragile prayers. Hosea, verse, uh, Hosea, verse, uh, Hosea 11, verse 4, speaks of God bending to feed his people. Like a, a parent that sees a child struggling with their food, and instead of saying, you should know better by now, the father gets down on our level, and he gives us what we need. He nourishes us with his love. Psalm 30, verse, uh, Isaiah 30, verse 18 Get this one. Like, forget about my exercise. Spend a year in Isaiah 30, verse 18. Our God waits. Some translations put it like this. He longs to be gracious to us. He waits. He's like the father who's like, I'm ready. I'm ready with the bear hug. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready with the bear hug. And he's just waiting for us to return to him so he can wrap us up with his arms of love. He waits, he longs, his, his heart like bleeds with desire to let us know that we are his beloved, that we belong to him. Psalm 23, I wasn't, this isn't in my notes, but earlier in the service, what's the final verse of Psalm 23? Surely goodness and mercy will pursue me, follow me, or as it has been said, the most accurate translation of that word is surely goodness and mercy will hunt me down all the days of my life. God is looking to hunt you down with goodness and with mercy. That is the posture of God towards sinners who turn back to him, waiting to be gracious, bending to feed, leaning to listen, hunting down with goodness and with mercy. What is God doing today in your life? is pursuing you in love. If you are lost like the younger son, he's waiting, waiting for you to come back so he can sweep you up in his arms of love. If you think you have to earn something just to come and experience his presence, he is waiting to shut down your welcome home speech. Oh, just let me be a servant. And he's waiting to cut you off in the middle as the father does and say, none of that. Slay the fattened calf, get the robe, get the ring, we're going to have a party. He's waiting to treat you with that kind of grace. If you're alienated from him like the older son, what is he doing? He's coming out to seek relationship with you. He's coming to find you, to bring you into his party, his embrace. And I just want to pose this question this morning before make a final comment to close about our culture as a church. Let this question be the one you take away. How might it change your relationship with God to see if you saw him waiting at the porch for you or leaving the party behind for you every day when you started your day? I've been getting into the habit before I do anything else in the morning, mm -hmm. I wake up, I try, try to just say, God, I'm coming to you as the prodigal comes to you. Even before I've left my bed, I've probably sinned. <laughs> I've probably worried about something. I've probably left the crying toddler a few minutes longer than I should have, or I've, I've probably done something wrong, Lord, but I'm starting my day like the prodigal coming home, running down the road to you, my father. How would it change your relationship with God if this is how you saw him? If you realize his posture is towards you moment by moment. Got a need? Guess what? God is leaning to listen more willing than you are to pray. Feeling hungry? Feeling black? Guess what? God is getting ready to bend down to feed you. Being scared, 
Yes. For he is waiting to be gracious to you, to wrap you in his arms. How would it revolutionize our relationship with God if we realize this is what he is like? He is a father whose posture is leaning towards us in love. It's my dream for every one of us that we would discover God like this as our Father who loves us. And then to close then, what is the invitation for us as a church? Very simply this. I haven't got much time to unpack this, but maybe it just needs to be stated as simply as possible today. Become like the Father. That's your mission, church. That's your marching orders. It's very simple. Our mission as a church, our purpose as a church, is to embody the Father's house here, to become like the Father. And I've got news for you. Who do you become like? You become like who you spend most time with. Our world is full of older brothers, cynics, people who are entitled, people who are self-interested, all about maintenance mode, all about their comfort. Let me tell you something. If you spend all your life, every day, in the world, like living your life on X or whatever it's called these days, Twitter or Facebook, and just breathing in the anger and the, the bitterness and the cynicism of the world around us, if you spend all your time with the world, don't be surprised if you become like the older brother or like the younger brother. All this stuff there that's good and enjoyable. Oh, I'm enslaved. Oh, I need to return home. Become like the Father. You will become like who you spend the most time with. If you see the Father as leaning towards you in love, don't you want to spend some time with him? Don't you want to carve out time to get in his presence this week? Don't you want to carve out time to say, Father, show me what the party in heaven is like. Give me a week of like, just give my ears just a little bit of a capacity to hear the celebration that's going on around your throne right now as you are building your church and as you are welcoming the lost home. Give me a taste of that joy. Whew. Our lives could be very different. If we spent time with the Father, our mission of the church doesn't start with programs. It starts with posture. Programs are great. We need programs. We need initiatives. We need new congregations. We need children's work. We need youth clubs. We need all kinds of ways to bless and to serve people. But a program without a posture, that is the Father's posture, may be doing more bad than good. We need to be filled with the Father's posture so that when people encounter us on a book table, or when people encounter us, in our workplace or when people encounter us in a kids club or a youth club what are they encountering they're just encountering a little taste of what the father's love and his welcome is like become like the father spend time with him to become like him one who leans forward in compassion to welcome home the lost who willingly dirties themselves to bring sinners home. This is the invitation of the parable of the prodigal son. And as we close, maybe John could come and lead us in a song of response and the, the guys in the band. I think I just want to leave us with a question this morning. 